The Apostle Paul says to the church at Corinth, For I received from the Lord that what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. This, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May the Lord teach us today to connect the things that God always intended us to connect. We celebrate this as often as we do to remember him, but also to obey him, to preach the gospel, to share the good news until he comes. Thank you. Please be seated. The Lord's Supper and the Great Commission. I read to you our text already, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. I want to just briefly cite in this passage two things. We'll be looking at this in more detail as we're moving through 1 Corinthians on Sunday morning. First of all, you see Paul's recitation of the scene at the Lord's Supper. And secondly, you see Paul's recognition of the significance of the Lord's Supper. Let's look at this. Verses 23 to 25, his recitation of the scene at the Lord's Supper. He says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. So he's, he's claiming that he didn't go looking at historical data. That this is when he was taught in the Arabian desert by the Holy Spirit after his world was turned upside down on the Damascus Road. He was converted and he had to completely rethink retool, reinterpret, and come to understand what he'd been taught uh, as a good Jew, a skilled, capable Jew, as he grew to be a Pharisee, that had to all be revamped. I received it from the Lord. But I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup, and after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The Lord taught him, and he's communicating that. And it's interesting, when you take what Paul says here and compare it, just we're going to look real quickly at, at Matthew, Mark, and Luke's telling of this in their respective gospel accounts. You see that, that he was given by the Lord an accurate summary, and he remembered accurately the summary he was given by the Lord. Look at Matthew's retelling, for example, uh, emphasizes the two elements and their corresponding symbols. The bread is the body, the cup is the blood of the covenant. Look at Matthew 26, 26 to 29. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. He took a cup when he had given thanks, Gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He adds this, in my Father's kingdom. He's going to deny himself of this. Mark's retelling captures the same thing. And even talks about the denial, the self-denying act of Jesus, where he will not drink again until that day. It, it reads just like, essentially like Matthew's does in Mark 14, 22 to 25. I would encourage you to jot that down and, and read it when you get home. Luke's retelling uh, of this emphasizes the two elements, their symbols, uh, the self-denying commitment. But he adds this exhortation but they are to engage in the partaking of these elements in remembrance of him. Look at Luke 22, 18 to 20, particularly. He says in verse 19, do this in remembrance of me. You go back and look at our text, verses 23 to 25. You see this, that Paul captured it all. 
he uses the term remembrance. Lest we forget. You know, I think the dog's name is Doug in the movie Up. Am I right? Isn't that the dog's name? Doug. We are all way too much like Doug. We can leave divine worship with every intention renewed, refocused, and then life like a squirrel runs in front of us. And where are we going? Jesus knows our weakness. <clears throat> he knows our infirmities. He knows the temptations. That life comes at us so fast, so disruptive, that we need to be constantly reminded of who Jesus Christ is, what he came to do, and how that has affected or should affect our lives, the difference it should make as people who confess faith in him and claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Remember me. Remember me. Say, so how can we ever forget Jesus? But we do. We live and act as if we have forgotten him. As if his promises are not true. As if his death was not powerful. As, as if it was not complete. As if, as one writer said, I think it was Jerry Bridges said one time, he said, I had no trouble believing that I could not do anything to merit the work of Jesus Christ. It was all absolutely, freely, completely grace. He said, but after I was saved, I had trouble believing. <laughs> he said, I thought that somehow I could demerit that. I could, I could lose the merit of it. We have to remind ourselves that the death of Jesus Christ for sinners was all grace, freely grace, grace without any compelling reason in ourselves. Initiating in him, culminating in him, bringing us along with promises that he'll take us to the end. Remember Jesus Christ. Remembering when the world challenges your, your lifestyle, challenges your ethic, challenges your mission. Remember Jesus. Remember when the world accuses you and hates you. That, remember Jesus. It hated him first. Remembering. Paul gives an accurate recitation. But really, the, what I want to see today is number two, Paul's recognition of the significance of the Lord's Supper. And this one word, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I admire congregations that weekly participate in the celebration of communion. I admire them. I don't know for the life of me how you do that effectively and not turn it into ritual, but I admire them. We moved several years ago from a quarterly celebration to a monthly celebration and perhaps should examine down the road that we need to pick up the frequency of that. As often as you do this, you can't do it too often. You can do it too seldom. Paul recognizes the value, the significance of celebrating together the Lord's Supper. This word says you proclaim the Lord's death. That every time you do this, and there seems to be a double meaning here, a double edge to this sword, that we plurally, when we speak about the elements and recognize that we're taking the wafer because it represents the body of Jesus Christ broken and crushed for us, on the cross. We're taking the, the cup because the fruit of the vine held therein symbolizes the blood that Jesus shed for us, for the forgiveness of sins, that we're, we're remembering and proclaiming in symbol and to one another the gospel. Well, another meaning, I think, is that we, that we talk about the gospel. You, to, <laughs> you know, it's sad. A fellow can preach, if you can call it preaching, and not mention the gospel. It happens all the time. Capable, going through, through passages of Scripture very, very keenly, very accurately, but not proclaim the gospel, not, as we're looking on Sunday nights, not, not finding Jesus Christ. As my friend, as my friend Joe Neeson says, you, you, you preach your text, you read your text, and you take it and you run to the cross from it every time. But the Lord's Supper, you can't even call it the Lord's Supper if the gospel is not set forth 
in the context of sharing it together and, and declaring it together and commenting on it. You do proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. This word proclaim here is a compound word. You would recognize it if, if we spelled it out, uh, transliterated in English, you would recognize an intensive form on the front and the word we get for angel, the messenger. Because see, it's, it's to bear a message, it's to announce, it's to report. The intensified form that we find here only occurs in Acts and in the writings of Paul 17 times in the New Testament. One writer said it reflects language, the language of mission. The language of mission. Every one of us knows. You know it from your reading of Scripture. You know it from, from preaching and teaching in this pulpit in the classrooms through the years. You know it from conversations. You know it from discussions we've had about purpose statements. You know it that the Great Commission is ours. That we must engage in it. Jesus gave it in five different ways in the four Gospels in the book of Acts. And we've gone through that. We've preached on that. I'm not going to do that again today, but I'm going to tell you that, that Paul recognized the significance of the Lord's Supper because it is tied to the mission. That it's designed to provoke us that we never see the Lord's Supper as an end in itself. Yes, we can derive comfort from remembering Jesus Christ. Yes, we can examine ourselves. To, to repent where we need to repent and, and, and come through this with a fresh commitment to holiness. But we have not celebrated the Lord's Supper as it should be celebrated if it does not provoke us and stir up in us in new and fresh ways, perhaps even convict us of the Great Commission and our role in that. To communicate a message. In fact, I think we hypocrite ourselves if we think we can proclaim the Lord's death here among ourselves and it not provoke us, as John Stott said in his book, Our Guilty Silence. Real worship stirs up inevitable witness. And faithful witness provokes in us the worship of God. This, as often as we do it, celebration of the Lord's Supper is designed to stir in us that cycle and keep it fresh and never let it get stale. And when we leave here, burning in us is that Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left this crimson stain in me, and he washed it white as snow. And I am a beggar who has found bread. I've been given the bread of life. Somebody faithfully shared the gospel with you. Somebody faithfully prayed for you. Someone cried out until your soul was rescued by the gospel. We're reminded of that in the Lord's Supper, and we go forth determined that we're going to keep praying. You, we, Every one of us here, we could share notes. We've shared them in prayer meeting before. We bear in our heart a burden for a face, a name, several who do not know Jesus Christ. And this celebration is designed to stir us anew and afresh to keep on praying for them. Don't give up. Don't give up. Our God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above anything that we know how to think or ask according to his power at work in us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't give up. But I've, Pastor, I've, I've told the gospel this person, tell him one more time. Tell him one more time. One more time. We're shining the flashlight of God's glorious grace in the gospel into the eyes of blind people. And while we cannot make them see, we have no reason to believe they will ever see if we are content to turn off the light. Keep shining. Keep shining. The Great Commission is ours. We have, you read it in our covenant, in our purpose statement. We're we followers of Christ. We're to love God with all that we are because he's worthy. We're, we're to love one another because Jesus said that's one of the infallible marks of Christians. It's one of the powerful evangelistic tools that the Holy Spirit uses. The world will believe that Jesus came and was sent from God when they see Christians loving one another. We love others. We love strangers. We, we serve the world. 
because we are disciples called to be disciple makers. And this precious celebration, this memorial of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ provokes us to that. And I don't know if I've done a good job of connecting that for you. But we have to connect it. That being willing to come to the Lord's table means that we're willing to take the glorious gospel to the world. And I want, desperately want that, to be increasingly normative in our lives. Habits, good habits that we form as Christ followers. Disciples, wanting to be disciple makers. Stumbling, yes. Fumbling, yes. Floundering, yes. Imperfectly, yes. <laughs> All of that. But determinedly, disciples. Making disciple makers. Let us remind one another. Today we have proclaimed the Lord's death again together as a congregation. Let us not take an unspoken vow of silence as we walk out of here, but rather let this fan and flame in new and fresh ways our commitment and determination to tell forth Jesus' death until he comes to a world that needs him, to family members who need him, to neighbors and friends who need him, fellow workers who need him, to show forth, proclaim, declare, witness, live this powerful renewal in the gospel until he comes. And when you stray, and we will, We'll bring one another back to this a month from now, Lord willing. In fact, it won't even be a month now. We celebrated a little late this one. Our Sunday in July. To bring one another back. Don't get distracted. Come back to focus. Why are we doing this? Jesus commanded that we do it. Set the example that we do it. But oh, brothers and sisters, it is so necessary for us that we come to the Lord's table again and again and clear away the clutter that has stepped into our lives since we last gathered here to remember Jesus Christ and commit in new and fresh ways to proclaim his powerful, saving death until he comes again. My prayer is that that's what you'll do. That you'll take this Lord's Supper that way. We dare not make more of it than we should, but we dare not make less of it than we should. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we bow before you in Jesus' name. We thank you for our Savior, his life, his death, the fact that he was buried in a borrowed tomb, that he rose again three days later, and that you... We're kind to have people speak that truth to us in the journey and your spirit attend it so that we were brought from death to life and saved by grace through faith and now have left us this powerful memorial symbol, his body, his blood, to do this in remembrance of him over and over and over again. You've left it for us so that we can proclaim to one another the glorious life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and provoke us to not to be content simply to share it with one another here behind these walls, but to go forth proclaiming Jesus' death until he returns. Oh, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Find us faithful when you come. By your Holy Spirit, make us the committed, determined disciple makers because you have been pleased to make us disciples. For we ask this in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen.